If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This morning, we've lit in the candle of love. The candle of love. And many of you have come today and you have brought the snowflake that we've been handing out for the last couple of weeks. And at the end of the service today, we're going to have an opportunity to just really remember those who have, that we love that have gone before us in the Lord. And we're going to hang our snowflakes on the trees or on the garland here in front. But this is a comfort service. And I pray this morning at the reading of the word of God, and at the declaration of the truth of God's word, that you are going to find comfort and hope today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, I want you to stand with me. And uh, even if you don't have your Bibles, I want you to stand with me. We're all going to stand together. 1 Thessalonians 4, we're going to begin with verse number 13. And the Bible says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers. Everyone say, ignorant. Don't be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a... Come on, say it again. With a shout and with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Everyone say caught up. up. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Did you hear that? And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. I want to speak to you this morning on while we are awaiting the return of Jesus, we can find comfort. While we are awaiting the return of Jesus, we can find comfort. One of my very closest friends, father, passed away last night, and uh, we've been praying, and actually I had texted him yesterday morning and said, hey, Pastor Gary, I'm just praying your father feels released to go to be with the Lord, and he did. He, He passed away yesterday afternoon. And I just want to pray for Pastor Gary. He pastors Glad Tidings Assembly, which is located over in Ocoee. They're the church that we partnered with. They're the sponsoring church of the Jamaican Orphanage. And he and his family are in the panhandle today. And I just want to pray comfort for them. Will you join with me as we pray for Pastor Gary and his church family? Father, I thank you, Lord, for grace. Thank you, Lord, that at the hearing of your word, our hearts can be stirred today to believe in a new dimension, that we can find comfort. We can find comfort, Lord, that our loved ones that have gone before us, we will see again someday. Lord, I pray today for every person at the sound of my voice. I pray that you'll give them a grace to hear. I I pray, Lord, today for Pastor Gary Howell and the Glad Tidings family. I, I ask, Lord, that you'll bring comfort and peace to that home, to his wife, Christy, to their children, to his mother, to his brothers and sisters and their families. Lord, we know that in this season, it's a season of grief, Lord, that they're walking through. We thank you that we have the Holy Spirit who lives and abides in us and fills our hearts full of hope. God, I ask this now. Lord, for every person that's here, give them an ear to hear and give me a mouth to speak. I ask this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. You know, the loss of a loved one at any time is difficult. There's a grief. There's a sadness. There's a sorrow. Both of my parents passed away fairly young. For me, it was fairly young. I'm 53. My mom passed away at 53 in 1995. My dad passed away at the age of 59. But they both passed away right around the Christmas holiday season. And I, I still remember that, that feeling, that sense of grief, that sadness, that sorrow. And I, I, I want you to know today, I understand that. I've walked through that. And many of you are here today. Some of you have walked through it just recently. Brother Juan, right down here in the front, uh, the third row, his wife passed away two weeks ago. Just went to be with the Lord. She'd fought, a, she'd, fought her, she'd fought her fight. She'd fought the good fight, but now she's with the Lord. And there may be others in this room. In the first service, there were several whose family members who had just passed away. This last year, we did 10 funerals here at City Church. And it's a reality of life. It's a reality of life that someday we and then everyone else in this room will breathe our last breath. Unless the Lord Jesus returns. Unless the Lord Jesus returns. And it is our blessed hope. It's what we are awaiting. It's what the whole concept of Advent is about. Advent isn't just celebrating the birth of Christ. 
although that's important. <laughs> Jesus didn't grow up and live a sinless life and die on the cross and rise from the dead unless he was born. He did come into the, into the world. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am chief. But the fact is, Jesus made a promise that I'm going to come again. And that is our hope today. And that's what we, as Christ followers, are awaiting. We are awaiting the return of Jesus. A pastor in my hometown, his name is Roger Barrier, pastor of a church called Casas Adobas. I, I was reading online this week, and I came across a letter that one of his parishioners had written to him. And she was talking about this kind of that sense of sadness and sorrow that she was experiencing at Christmas time. And I want you to hear her letter and then his response. She said, Pastor, a lot of people during the holiday seasons, we act like it's all, it's all a time of great joy. And it is for many of us until someone pulls the curtain back. Behind the curtain, we find children being tossed back and forth between parents. Some can't afford to buy presents. There's just no money to spare. Some are jobless. Some are sick. Some families are tragically dysfunctional. Some parents can't stand their children, and some children can't stand their parents or their assemblies. Some have lost loved ones. Some feel so lonely. lonely. Others feel rejected. Holidays can bring out pain. Could you give us some advice on how to heal some of the hurts we may encounter. The pastor's response was masterful, on point. He said, Dear Jennifer, Alexander McLaren, an old Scottish preacher, once said, Please be kind to everyone you meet because everyone's fighting a battle. Everyone's fighting a battle. When I recite this quote, I ask the folks in the congregation to look up and down the row. I want you to do that right now. Just look up and down your row. Every person in this room right now, the person sitting next to you, the person down your row, is fighting some kind of battle. We are imperfect people. We live in an imperfect world. Therefore, we will all experience suffering and hurts. We live in a fallen world where sickness, sin, and death are rampant among us. It is a fact of life. And for the unbeliever, a very hopeless reality. For the believer in Christ, we can find comfort for our hurt. And from the truth of Scripture, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Because of our relationship with Christ and the hope that we have in the resurrection and the return of Jesus, we can experience his comfort. We can experience his comfort. Paul the Apostle wrote this short epistle, five chapters. Paul the Apostle wrote this church to a, ch to a group of people who were really ignorant. They were really ignorant. They lacked knowledge of what would happen when the hum human body dies. The theme, the emphasis, the hope of the early church was the return of Christ. The fact is, is, as you read through the New Testament, you will see the epistles and the writers of the New Testament expressing this hope over 300 times. It was the blessed hope. It's what they were looking for. They actually believed that Christ was going to return in their generation. You know that, what that shows us today because we're 2,000 years from that experience of Christ descending into heaven. 2,000 years ago, the early church believed they had a sense of hope. It was an imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2,000 years have flown under the bridge of history and we still have that sense of imminency. We just don't know. And Paul the Apostle lays out to the church at Thessalonica, here's the hope that we have. Let me give you some instruction. I don't want you to be ignorant. So how do we find comfort during our times of loss this Advent season? First, we must accept the reality of sorrow at the death of a loved one or loss. We must accept the reality of sorrow at the death of a loved one or loss. He said, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. We have a wonderful ministry here at City Church called Grief Share. Made of Scott leaves it, and next semester they're going to be starting back up again. And I want to encourage you today, if you have, have a great sense of loss, if you've lost a loved one and you're still trying to work through it, this small group is for you. This is the, and I was going through some of their pictures. Uh, it's, uh, their Facebook page is closed, but I'm part of that group. And I was going through some of the pictures and looking at their celebrations and the times that they were coming together to comfort and encourage one another. And there's strength, there's power when we console, when we get to other believers and we pray for one another and we encourage each other with that we hope, the hope that we have in Christ. You see, the, ch the church at Thessalonica lived in a pagan culture. 
And they were, they were people who had come out of that lifestyle, out of this Greek lifestyle that really didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in it. Like many Americans today just believe that when you die that that's it. There's a famed physicist by the name of Stephen Hawking. You might have seen him. He, he's the guy that's the paraplegic. He's, he's in the wheelchair, and, and he, can't, he can't talk or communicate but through his computer. And he's considered to be the smartest man in the world. He has great theories about black holes, and he's written incredible books about the theories of creation and life and how this all took place. And, but he said in the Guardian magazine, the London Guardian just recently, he said, there is no heaven or afterlife. For broken down computers, that's us. There's no hope for broken down computers. That is a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. That's what the world believes. So the philosophy of the world, when you take it out and you live it and break it down to an everyday reality is, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. That's the philosophy of our generation. No hope in an afterlife, no reality, no sense that they're going to be judged for the things that they do in this life. Jesus said, Jesus said, we will be judged for every deed that we do, good or evil, in this life. You see, when you don't have a hope of eternity, when you don't have a hope of an afterlife, you have no one to be accountable for. And so you can live any way that you choose to live. You define your own morality. You make up your own set of guidelines and rules in how you live. But that's not the truth. That's not the reality. That's not the fact that Jesus simply declared. You see, our life today, if we lack hope in the resurrection and the return of Jesus, it may cause us to grieve hopelessly and aimlessly. If we don't understand this, if we walk in ignorance, like the church at many at the church at Thessalonica were doing, if we walk in ignorance, we will live hopelessly. We will walk through very sorrowful times and have no sense of hope. And when we have no hope, we will live aimlessly. Hope floats your boat. Hope floats your boat. Keep hope alive. The Bible says, for whatever things were written before, were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. See, we don't sorrow as the world sorrows. See, we will experience the sorrow of separation. Even Jesus experienced this sorrow. His good friend Lazarus had passed away, had died. His sisters felt very prematurely. And the Bible says that when Jesus encountered the tomb, he wept. See, there was a separation of sorrow. When your loved one goes on to be with the Lord, when the person that, that, that you, your parent or your, or your child or your friend, whoever it is, that, there's a separation. It is our final enemy. It's the final enemy that every person in this room will experience. I've done many, many funerals. I don't even know how many funerals, but I've done many funerals over the years, and I've seen all different kinds of responses. I've seen the separation of sorrow, but I've also seen the desperation of sorrow. I've seen people who had no hope. I was at a funeral recently. We had a funeral right here in this church, and there was a sense of hopelessness. It was a very tragic. It was a double murder in our community. And I saw some of the family members trying to deal with the grief. Literally, I saw one of the daughters try to crawl inside of the casket to be with her father. It was, it was harrowing. It was, it was shaking. It shook me to my core. See, there's, there's a separation of griefs. But for many people who have no hope in the eternal life and the resurrection of the believer, there's a desperation of separation. Desperation. See, not having a hope in the resurrection of Christ, not having a hope that we will meet Jesus again with those who've gone before us, not having a hope leaves us hopeless. Not having that hope. See, Jesus spoke these words of comfort to Mary and Martha's sister. You see, they were experiencing that grief. They were, they were experiencing that, that sense of desperation. They did believe in the afterlife, but they just hadn't wrapped their heart around it. And Jesus points his finger, and he looks directly at them, and he says these words, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. <laughs> Hear me today. Everyone who lives in me Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. 
You see, you're a Christ follower today. The spirit of God lives in you. Your spirit will live forever and ever. And then he turns to them and he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this today? Do you believe that you're going to live forever and ever? If you believe in Christ, you will never die. Oh, the outward man, this tent will die. This tent will, this outward body will have a season of resting until the resurrection. But see, the promise, the hope, the comfort that we find today is that we believe, we believe, that we believe that in our sorrow, we can experience the resurrection. We can experience the resurrection. See, we believe in the resurrection of believers, and because we believe, it gives us comfort today. Look at verse number 14. Paul says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with those who sleep in Jesus. We find our fulfillment. We find our sense of fulfillment in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a historical fact. The fact of our dating the reason that it's December 18th, 2016 today is because even historians acknowledge that Jesus not only was born, but Jesus died and rose again from the, from the grave. 500 people actually saw a physical resurrected Christ. Many people try to deny the reality of the resurrection, but it's true. Jesus made this promise. Although you will try to kill this body, on the third day, I will rise again. You see, our faith is rested in this. It is the faith of the Christian believer today. Paul says, if Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is in vain. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is alive. Come on. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. <laughs> We believe in the resurrection, not only of Christ, we believe in the resurrection of the believer. We believe that the believer is going to be resurrected. Even so, God will bring with those, bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. This word sleep in the Greek is a euphemism, euphemism for death or for dying. It's a euphemism. See, this tent, this body will rest but our soul our spirit man will live forever this temporary body until jesus comes again until he calls us home to be with him it's going to rest in the grave it's going to be asleep but the fact is today the bible says in second corinthians so we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body we are absent from the lord for we walk by faith and not by sight for we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. See, the moment, the moment you and I breathe our last breath, this spirit man, this spirit man, which never dies, will be in the presence of Jesus. We find comfort in knowing that Jesus spoke these words. Look what he says in verse number 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This isn't Pastor Eugene's opinion. This isn't John Calvin's opinion. This isn't John Wesley's opinion. This isn't Augustine's opinion. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. We speak this word of truth to you that we who are alive, we, those who are dead that have gone before us, and we who are alive will meet the Lord in the air again. It's a fact. To be absent from the body is to be present with Jesus. We find our confident in the return we find our comfort in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the early church believed that Jesus was going to return for them. We believe today that Christ can come at any time. Some people believe that there's still prophetic scriptures that need to take place before Christ returns. I believe that Jesus can come at any moment. I believe that any moment Jesus can return for those who are looking and awaiting his appearing. We, look what he says here. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who fall asleep. For those who are waiting as appearing, it's our blessed hope. It's our blessed hope. For those who are not looking and awaiting the appearing of Jesus, they're going to miss it. They're going to miss that moment when Christ returns for those who are looking and waiting for him. And thirdly, this morning, as we hopefully await the return of Jesus and the great reunion, 
we can find comfort. As we hopefully await the return of Jesus and the great reunion, we can find comfort. For the Bible says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. With a shout. There's a grand entrance. There's a glorious entrance. And when Jesus comes again, there's going to be a shout. All the world, the Bible says, every eye will see him. Not only will there be a shout, but there'll be an angel. Many scholars believe it's Michael the archangel, the same angel that's going to cast Lucifer, Satan, the devil, into the bottomless pit forever and ever. He's going to show up on the scene. And then the trumpet is going to blow. Come on, trumpet. Everyone say trumpet. The trumpet is going to blow, and Jesus is going to appear in the sky. Jesus is going to return with those, those spirits who have gone before us and their bodies are going to arise. See, even God is a God of honor. It doesn't matter what happened to the human body. It doesn't matter how long they've been in the grave. Somehow God is going to bring all those molecules, all that DNA back together, even if it was scattered in the oceans. God's going to bring them back together because he is the God of resurrection and the God of life. And guess what, folks? That body, that DNA, that molecule, that ligament is going to join back together and meet that body and we which are alive and remaining shall join them in the air someone said amen oh it's the hope of the believer today he descended with the shout everyone say shout oh i love the shout we run around here and do some shouting today jesus is coming he's coming for those who are looking and awaiting his appearing see those who have gone before us in christ Oh, they're, they're, going to, they're going to rise first. God's a God of honor. The dead in Christ shall rise. And then we which are alive and remaining will meet them in the air. For the believer today, it's our blessed hope. The taking away of the believer. The being caught up into heaven. For the believer, it's blessed. For the person who doesn't believe, it's going to be a bumper. See, when that trumpet shouts, things escalate because there'll be two more trumpets after that trumpet. The next trumpet will announce the great judgments that are coming to the earth. You can read it for yourself in the book of Revelation, verses chapters 9 through 11. There are great judgments. And then at the end of chapter 11, the closing of the judgments will take place. And every person, every person that rejected Christ will stand before the judgment seat and give account for the life. Every person. And their eternal destiny, their eternal destiny, there's no more opportunity. There's no more chances in this life. We have the moment to say yes. We have the moment to put our faith in a resurrected Christ, to believe in his soon return. But if we reject that truth, if we reject that reality, we will be cast with the enemy. We'll be cast with Satan and Lucifer into the lake of fire forever and ever. Wow. Wow. The trumpet's going to sound. And when that trumpet sounds, it is the blessed hope for the believer. It's what we've been waiting for. It's what we're hoping for. But for the unbeliever, for those who reject this truth, it's a day of a bummer. We're going to receive our reward. Our reward to be with Jesus forever and ever. To see him face to face. We sing it. We sang, what a beautiful name. We're not just going to sing about him. We're going to be with him. We're going to be with him. With a host of angels. I love the book of Revelation. At the very end it says there's 24 elders that are surrounded the throne. And the angels are all declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. All of creation will declare, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. We get a glimpse of his glory. We get a glimpse of that unbelievable glory. It lights up our soul. It lights up our heart with a sense of expectation that Jesus is coming again. We're going to see him face to face. Right now, we're looking off into the distance, and it's our hope. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more sadness. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more Satan. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more loss. There'll be no more divorce. There'll be no more brokenness. There'll be no more lack in our lives. It is the hope of the believer today. Oh, that moment 
Our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. We make a great exchange. This temporal, this body, that if the Lord doesn't return, is going to rest, is going to sleep. We change that for the immortal, the immortal, the eternal, forever and ever and ever. New creation, new body, new man, new woman, new person. See, that's our hope. Our citizenship. We are just pilgrims passing through. This world is not our home. This is not our final place. We have an expectancy. We have a hope that Christ is going to come again for those who are looking and waiting his appearing. That is our comfort today. That is our comfort today. That is our hope today. That is our joy today. That is our love today. To comfort one another. How do we respond? Look what Paul says here in verse number 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Encourage one another. Console one another. Come alongside of one another. Come on, you can do this. Champion the cause of one another. We get weak and weary. The Bible says even the young men get weak and weary. But they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew your strength. I want to encourage your strength. I want to build your hope today. I want to build your faith today. I want you to know today. I want you to know that we have comfort. We have hope in Christ. The psalmist declared, Lord, you know the hope. You know the hopes of the helpless. Surely you will hear their cries and you will comfort them. Surely you will hear their cries and comfort them. Our lives today... Our life, your life, my life, the people that have gone before them, before us, our lives while we're living here on planet Earth are a test. Peter says, don't think it's strange that you go through all kinds of trials. There's something about fiery trials. There's something about the tests of life that do something deep within our heart. You know what tests do? You know what trials do? They cause us to become more dependent upon Jesus. When tests come, when trials come, the Bible says that they are fiery. And the purpose of fire is to purify. And what God is doing is God is purifying us so that we will be a glorious person when he recomes. So that we will be a victorious person when he recomes. The Bible declares that when Jesus comes, he's coming for a glorious church, a victorious church. Not a broken down, beat down, discouraged, don't believe church. He's coming for a group of people who are looking for his appearing, who are believing. The Bible says that they overcame the devil. They overcame every test and every trial by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of their testimony. And they loved not their life even unto death. This life is a test. This life is a trust. Jesus told the story about a man who was given talents. One man took five talents and he turned them into five more. One man took three talents and he turned them into three more. One man took one talent and he buried it. Your life is a trust. The time that you've been given. The giftings and the abilities that you've been given to serve other people and make a difference in your world and your treasure, your financial resources, will one day you'll be given account to God for. You see, one day we will stand before the Lord and we'll give an account for our life. And Jesus said, when you do well, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because you've been trustworthy in a very small thing, take charge of many more cities. See, my life and your life is a temporary assignment. The Bible says that David served God and his generation. Hear me today. One translation says, David served the purpose of God and his generation, and then he died. We had this moment right now. We have this moment right now to serve the purposes of God. You're here today. And you have loved ones that have gone before you. Their time, their time to serve God has passed. But we remember them. Isn't it wonderful how the scripture recounts to us those who've gone before us? 
Hebrews chapter 12 says that there's a great cloud of witnesses that stand before us. There's a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering you and I on today. I want to share with you two of them. These are two special people to me. The first one is my, my father. I'm a junior today. I'm a G Eugene Roy Smith Jr. My dad. My dad, we had a bumpy, bumpy teenage and young adult years. But when I surrendered my life to Christ, my dad was a person that I called almost every single day. I, I, my dad, like many passionate people and many church people, he had a lot of struggles in life. He had a lot of challenges. But one thing I learned from my dad was how to pray. Some of you have been around me a little bit, and, and I like to pray. And I learned from my dad how to call on God. My dad, if he would be in this room, you could hear him shout. <laughs> he could reverberate the walls of his prayers. I remember as a little boy, one time I was riding my bike down the street, and I could hear my dad in the shower, and he was praying in tongues. He was speaking in the Holy Ghost. I could hear him all the way down the street, and I was trying to ride as fast as I could to get away from him. <laughs> call on me, and I will answer and show you great and mighty things. My dad knew how to call on God in desperate times. He taught me how to pray. He taught me how to pray in times of desperation. <laughs> and then there's my mom. Got this one here. Her name is Linda Smith. Both my parents died. My mom died. At, my dad died at 59. My mom died at 53. My mom died in 19, November 4th, 1995. And this church is here because of her. My mom didn't grow up in a Christian home. This Jewish girl where Christ was never mentioned, but it has a curse word, somehow heard the gospel and gave her life to Jesus. I don't know how. But from that day, she told me from that day she got saved, her passion was to see people who were far from him come to faith in Christ. I mean, a whole time, as from the time I was a little boy, every vehicle my mom ever had, every vehicle she ever had, she'd bring people to church with her. She never came to church empty car. She never came to church by herself, never, not one time. She always brought people with her. We had an old pickup truck. It was a 1963 Dodge pickup truck. My dad let me take a spray, let me and my sister take a spray paint can to the truck. And the back of the truck was silver and the front was blue and it was goofy looking. And she put all these little kids' chairs and she'd drive around the neighborhood and she'd pick up kids and bring them to church. Every single Saturday, my mom would go out and knock on doors. And at the end of her life, when she could no longer crawl out of bed, true story, I'm not making this up, true story, when she could no longer get out of bed because cancer had racked and riddled her body, she got on the phone. She had names of every person, every person that she knocked in her little community, every child that was coming to church on the bus because of my mom. She'd call that family and say, bus is going to be there tomorrow. Don't forget. Give them a little reminder call every single week. My church, they first they had, first because she brought her truck, they, they had to buy her a van. Then they had to buy her another van. And then when the vans were full, they had to buy her a bus. It's a true story. Then they had to buy her another bus. I tell you what, I'm here today. I'm here today because I saw that example. I saw a person who loved God and wanted to see other people who were far from him. My comfort today is knowing, is knowing that there's going to be a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet's going to sound. And those bodies that are buried in Tucson, Arizona, those graves are going to split wide open. And the molecules and the DNA and the dust that's in the ground is going to all come back together. And they're going to have a resurrected body. And when that trumpet sounds, I'm going to meet them in the air. I want you to hear this today. We have comfort as we are awaiting the return of Jesus. We have comfort in this hope that those who've gone before us, we will see them and we will be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. Our ushers are gonna come at this time and you have brought your star. You brought your, or you brought your snowflake. I can't remember which one this is. It looks like a star, but you brought your snowflake today. As our ushers come, we're gonna have everyone stand across this room. If you didn't bring if you didn't bring one of these snowflakes, you can just allow the people that are in your row that brought them, uh, you can allow them to, to slip out. But I want everyone to stand with me this morning. And as you have your comfort star or your comfort snowflake, guys, could you bring the house lights down, please? 
We have trees on the side. We have ushers on the side. If you didn't receive a hook on your way in, they'll have a hook there for you. In just a moment, Miranda and Katie are going to sing, It Is Well With My Soul. And I'm going to ask you to come, and I'm going to ask you to put your ornament on the Christmas tree. If, if the Christmas tree area is full, many people have gone ahead and they put it on this garland right here in the front. There are actually hooks right here in the front. If you, right here on the little step, uh, on the little stool here, there's hooks here. You can go ahead and put one on your flake or on your snowflake. But I want to pray for you today. I want to pray that as we await the return of Jesus, that your heart is full of anticipation. Your heart is full of the hope of the return of Jesus. Your heart is at peace today. You can experience the comfort and joy that we find by the power of the Holy Spirit in this room today. Father, many people have brought their star today, brought their snowflake today. God, and I pray, I pray that in this moment there's a release of your Holy Spirit. There's a peace that only you can give. You can't buy it. You can't fake it. You can't make it. It's the peace of God that passes all understanding. And I pray, Lord, that as the song is sung and as we hang our ornaments on the tree, I pray that the peace of God would envelop them. God, I pray that they'd be filled with a sense of hope, a sense of eternity, that you are the God, you have a place called heaven, that you are preparing for those who are looking and awaiting your return. God, I speak this now. I speak the faith. I speak the hope. I speak the love. I speak the joy. I speak the comfort, Jesus, that only you can give in your mighty name.